how, how does everybody feel? Yeah, I feel good. It's deep. It's deep stuff. It's like surgery, um, but but you have to be fully awake during the surgery, and you have to be participating. So it's a, it's a different type of uh, gut wrenching surgery. Okay. Um, this final section, we're talking about we're talking about these bricks. So we have here our our tree, right? This is. Life's already hard as it is when we have different mindsets. Life gets super complex when we have things that happened to us, things that happen in life when we have wounds. But to complicate things all the more, there are four bricks here. There's, the, there's a wall that can be built up to the point where it's, it's a wall that prevents people from going here. <laughs> Right? Because if the goal is always uproot these things as they come up, never let anything grow down there underneath in the deep, dark places of our soul, we also have to deal with this wall that's being built. And these, there's four bricks to this wall. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. I think of these, these three bricks, I call them the bricks of bitterness. There's four bricks of, of bitterness. And bitterness is essentially unforgiveness. These are, four area, these are the four areas where if we had unforgiveness, um, they would land on one of these. Every model of spiritual fitness in the DOD, um, I, my, my, my buddy, is, is at the joint staff. I said, hey, can you send me your version of spiritual fitness? So I lined them all up. What I love about the models is there's always something about forgiveness in there. My friend, I have a friend who's been a, a counselor for years, a great counselor, Ernesto. And I say, Ernesto, how many, how many of your counseling cases have to do with forgiveness? He goes, 100%. I never do a counseling case that doesn't have to deal with some sort of forgiveness. Does anybody know how, how do you define forgiveness? How would you define forgiveness, anybody? I define it with uh, Disney's movie Elsa, uh, Frozen. Remember Elsa, she's singing, let it go, let it go. That's what actually what forgiveness is. The Greek word forgiveness is aphiemi, aphiemi, and it's a, it's a negation, ah, and uh, Theami is to hold on to something. So to let go of something, to forgive, Theami is to actually let it go. Which is ironic because in that movie, she has so much bitterness that the world freezes around her, right? She, she holds on to her resentment and she runs away from her problems and she doesn't deal with them. So it's just, it's just so ironic. If she forgives, then, then it doesn't get cold. So these four bricks, I think of them in terms of uh, debt-debtor language. Debt-debtor language. So here's, here's what that means. In this, in this debt-debtor language, somebody owes somebody something. So if you're angry, and if you're experiencing anger, which, well, 100% of us here experience, if we're being honest, it's because we believe somebody owes us something. So if I said, you know what, Jason, I don't like what you said to me. I'm angry at you. I'm really saying you owe me something, right? Whether you owe me an apology, you owe me that you owe me something because you did this to me. Guilt would be, you know, I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe I did that, so I owe me something. And it's con this constant, I'm beating myself up over and over because I can't believe I did it again. And so I just beat myself up. And, uh, and if you were like me, you were talking like, well, nobody's harder than me than on myself. Well, that, that's, that comes from a, a wounded place. Beating yourself up is not a healthy thing. Being kind to yourself and actually loving yourself is the challenge. 
my therapist, my current therapist, gave me a book called uh, The Missing Commandment, Love Yourself. It has been radical. I just finished it a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to read it again. Uh, uh, my friend Rob at SawCalf, he's, he's the deputy chaplain at SawCalf, uh, an amazing guy. He gave me a book called Love Yourself as If Your Life Depended on It. And uh, it has interesting, interesting exercises in there where you look in the mirror, you stare in the mirror, and you go, I love you. I love you. I think it's for like 10 minutes. It's just really, really awkward and uncomfortable for me. And I called Rob the other day, and I said, hey, hey bro, I, I did that. I did that exercise, and he started laughing. I did it in that mirror yesterday in the, in the, in the hotel. But, uh, but really, self-hate being hard on yourself, it's really a guilt issue because you did something so you believe you owe yourself something. And if you don't let yourself off the hook, then you have unforgiveness towards yourself. So we've defined forgiveness. I would like to give you a, a, a street definition of unforgiveness, and it would be this. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And so it's like, you're an idiot. Watch this. <laughs> you feel that? <laughs> yeah? Well, I'm going to take two, two sips now. <laughs> I'm really into wrestling. And when my son first got into wrestling, Ryder was 45 pounds, right? And I had him competing at like the high. He competed in MAWA, um, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling Association. So it's everywhere from Jersey down to Virginia. Ryder was a stud. It was, like my, it was like my dream come true. When I bought him his first wrestling shoes, I like snuggled with his shoes, and I just couldn't believe it was happening. And I was really serious about it. And we got to Mawa, and Ryder is just, he's killing it. He's, he's ducking kids. He's, and he makes it to the, um, was it quarterfinals? No, he had, he, had lost, he had lost in the quarters, and then he made it. It was consolation champion match, right? It was for third place. And I was like, here's here's Got it, buddy. And so they said, hey, uh, Barang, you got to report to the mat in like three minutes. And we, were, we ran to the mat. I'm like, hurry up. This is it. This is my dream come true, right? Like, how old was he when, he's, when, when we were over there? He's young, 45 pounds. We run there, and the other kid is waiting there with his dad. And they said, sorry, you missed it. Um, match goes to, you know, uh, def default goes to this kid. And I'm like, no, we're right here. We're ready. We're, we're ready. And the dad goes, no, my son's not, my son's not wrestling. We're going to take the third place medal. And I was like, fight us, you coward. And then, and then my friend Aaron, he's a wrestling, he's an assistant coach. He's like, he's like, let it go, Ryan. Let it go. Just. And I was, I was so angry. And I was like, I was like, they're right here. And then I get back to the stands, just totally defeated and just angry. The other coach goes, Ryan, you should be bitter. And I go, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. But I'll never forget. He said, choose bitterness. I got one friend saying, let it go. And the other one was the opposite. Let it go versus be bitter. Um, it's always good to know how to let these things go. So greed is interesting because greed in debt debtor language means the world owes me something. The Army owes me something. The Air Force owes me something. The Marines owe me something. The Navy owes me something. The Coast Guard owes me something. The Space Force owes me People owe me something. It's the accumulation of stuff. I need this. I believe I need this. And so if they, the, they did me wrong, they owe me. If I walk around with that debt, it manifests into keeping me unknown. And then if I'm unknown, this thing manifests shoots through here and I start behaving a certain way. You see, you see, like I'm just hitting it over and over again how this thing works. The last brick there is the brick of jealousy. In de debtor language, it is basically God owes me something or, or whatever your faith background is, Allah owes me something. Somebody, some, somebody, some supernatural being owes me something. Someone out of space and time, whatever that belief is, my higher power owes me something different. Uh, an, an example that, that I've grown to be comfortable sharing is my jealousy was 
Lord, why did you make me five foot one if I was only a little bit taller, you know? But then I realized my calling in life early on as a kid. One time we got locked out of the house and my dad put me through the bathroom window and I was able to <laughs> unlock the house and I was like the hero. And I was like, That's, this is my calling. But when we're jealous against God, and, and I, know, I know you do this, but I'm going to tie it back to our children. They do it all the time. They look in the mirror. They look on social media like, I don't want to look like that. Um, I'll never forget one Saturday Night Live episode. Uh, no, no, no. It was Whose Line Is It Anyways? Remember uh, Brady? Is that his name? Brady or Grady? Yeah, yeah. Wayne Brady, yeah. He stares into the camera. He's like, Mommy, how come I don't look like the people on Friends? And I was like, this is so true, right? Like, we, we put these people on, on, on camera, and they look perfect. We begin to think they're perfect, and we begin to think, because I'm not perfect, then I'm not like everybody else. And it's just this ongoing thing. So jealousy is, why do I have this color hair? Why was I born with this color skin? Why was I born into this tax bracket? Why do I have to be born into a military family? All these things are out of control. Like, why was I born in this country? Why was I... So when someone's living in jealousy, it's God owes me a different lot in life. I shouldn't be here, and this is also a cause, you know, one of the things that contributes to suicidal behaviors. Right? I'm jealous because of, of what I was born into or whatever. It goes here, and then it goes. And it's just this, it's just a vicious cycle. So guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy, there are things that need to be busted up. Sometimes you need to call your friends and be like, hey, uh, I need some help. Let me bust up this, bust up this brick wall. And here's, some, here's the thing. I want you to ask yourself, have I ever truly forgiven someone before? And it would not surprise me if more than half of the room sat here and they said, you know what, Ryan? I don't think I've ever forgiven anybody before. One, because it couldn't define it, so you can't apply what you don't know, and you can't know what you haven't learned. You can't learn what you haven't really sat down and studied. So, I, no, I guess I've never forgiven someone before. So an epiphany happens, and you're like, oh, my gosh. If I've never forgiven anybody, I'm walking around with a lot of resentment. Forgiveness is defined, another street definition, as walking out of a jail cell to realize it is no longer locked. In fact, it was never locked to begin with. And I was just hanging out in there. Uh, forgiveness is uh, setting a captive free to realize that, that you were the captive. So there's unforgiveness and forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice, and it, it's, always, it's always a choice. And I, when, when I'm praying, I don't ask... God, would you help me forgive this person? No, it's, it's I choose to. This, this, these are the words. I choose to forgive you. A great book. It is the premier book for grief counseling, at least at Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton and throughout a lot of hospitals. It's called the Grief Recovery Handbook. A monumental work. It's Maybe it's like on 32nd edition. Okay. The Grief Recovery Handbook talks about uh, forgiveness. Which, when, when people are going through grief, like every single teenager in that room, every time they PCS, Grief Recovery Handbook says that's the most overlooked form of grief that, that we don't address with our children who are constantly moving. So because of that, we've sat down with our children. When we move, when we, P, when we PCS, how does everybody feel? Let's journal. Let's talk about it. When I was going to pick up, um, I was just at the airport on Thursday before coming here. And I walked by and I saw Ryder's good buddy getting on a plane. And I was like, wow, this is, a, this is an amazing moment. So I, I, I was like, what's up? What's up, everybody? I, you know, I gave, gave the little brother a fist pal and hugged my buddy who's, who's, a, who's a contractor. And then uh, I just, in that moment, I said, hey, man, we're going to miss you. And, and I know this is going to be hard. And it's okay to cry. And I want, when, you, when you get to your new duty station, I want you to, I want you to journal how you feel. And we're going to FaceTime as well. And you talk to a writer and, and keep in contact and giving them the freedom to know like it's going to be hard it's okay to cry and those those are things that are healing um, every single one of them in there every single move should be how has this made you feel 
especially, and I'm not, I'm not there yet. A lot of you are w way ahead of me, but I can't imagine pulling someone out during the high school years. We'll, we'll, we will leave here when Ryder's a freshman. And he loves his buddies. It's going to be hard. We, we cry every time. We cry every time. But such is life and life in the military, and, and we're not going to let it turn into something that's destructive. We're going we're gonna to deal with the loss. We're going to deal with the sadness. We're going to talk about it. And our home is constantly a place where, where, where wounds and feelings and emotions are welcome. They're welcome. Um, oh, I'm going to show you a, a video. You can teach children how to, how to forgive. This is Kailea. She, at this time, she was what? How old is she here? Yeah, maybe three. My little Hawaii baby. And uh, we, we taught her how to forgive. Yeah, so, so in this one, her brother, like, he was running, and then he bumped into her, and she got super sad. And, and, then, and I say, uh, well, how does that make you feel? And she goes, sad. And I go, well, what do you want to do with your sadness? And she goes, forgive him. But, like, to... To, to constantly drill this thing, you, you got to check this out, what she says. Why are you crying? Because we bumped into each other. And how does that make you feel? Sad. And what do you want to do with your sadness? Forgive him. Forgive him? Nice. Go, go, forgive him. Okay. But uh, she's also the one that was yelling at me this morning. <laughs> so, slide here. Who's behind all my problems? Dang it, that's me. <laughs> Who's lied to you more than anybody else? Yeah, a uh, survey says it's, it's you. Because every lie that we believe, it's because I convinced myself that it was the truth. So, so an, an ongoing question is, what lie am I believing right now? What lie am I believing? And I'm going to choose not to perpetuate that lie. If you can do this with your teenagers too, what, what lie are you believing? Another question is, what, what agreements am I making? What agreements am I making with the enemy of my soul? So just think about anything that has to do with death and destruction, anything that's negative, I, I call that the enemy because it's, it's the enemy of my, my mind, it's the enemy of my soul, and what agreements am I making? So that's how we, that's how we bust up the bricks. Um, this is key to go back to the emotions thing. When, when, we, when we teach our children how to get in touch with it, we want to be emotionally intelligent, and we sit down with them and we say, um, show me how, tell me how this feels. Is anybody in the FOCUS program? So FOCUS is an evidence-based uh, program. It began out of UCLA over a dozen years ago. It's amazing. I've been sharing about them for a long time. They're on base. Look up FOCUS. Uh, and um, they will sit down, and they'll do sessions one-on-one -on -one with the parents, and then do sessions one-on-one -on -one with your children, and then they'll, they'll do a family session. And FOCUS stands for Families Overcoming Under Stress. It's the, it's the most like un, under util, underutilized program. It's an amazing program that the military has. So I encourage you, sign up for Focus. But we have a thing on our refrigerator from Focus, and it has a, a, a cartoon and like little faces, and, and Kyler, my six-year-old, points to it like, how do you feel? And he's like, that one. He'll point at the excited one, or he, sometimes he'll point at the sad face, but they, they do a great job. For us, for us as adults, what has gone on in our lives, and can we identify it? All right, here's, here's where we're going to end with, um, and it's not easy. It's more work, but it's necessary, and it's, it's probably the most powerful thing that, that you'll do. In AA, uh, step four in AA, and I won't ask anybody if they've been in AA because it's anonymous. But step four is the fearless moral inventory. It's my favorite thing to, to go through. In the fearless moral inventory, they write down 
how they feel about everybody. I feel this towards Johnny because he looked at my wife. He looked at my wife, and I feel this towards him, and I forgive him. And they call it fearless moral infantry because you just have to, you just, you just go. You just go, and you just keep writing. Everybody and anybody that needs to be uh, forgiven. So for, for this exercise, I'm, I'm going to show you, um, for lack of a better word, the formula for forgiveness. But in, in any book that you'll read, uh, someone who knows what they're talking about with forgiveness, you'll see, these, you'll see these elements. It's a choice, first of all. So you cite who the person is. So I choose to forgive, i.e., let it go. I let go of, of this, and then you list what they did or didn't do. I'm going to ask you to, to, to delve into the, to the subconscious again and see what, see what just comes out with your offhand. And then, and then if you want to, after a while, move back to your regular hand. But I want to see what you come up with when you just start writing. Okay, uh, who is it? What did they do or didn't do or failed to do? And then how did it make you feel? Not angry, not pissed off. One person told me I, I just wanted to slit his throat. I was like, okay, well, thank you. What went on before that? Well, he gave me an eval that was just horrible. Oh, you felt betrayed. Or he said that, I felt betrayed. Good job, good job, let's go. That was, that was another big guy type. Okay. Let's see, let's see what happens. At the end of this initial motion, uh, you can say, I cancel their debt. They owe me nothing. I made a list. Where's my list? I made a list here of everything that my wife owes me. You want to see it? Blank. And here's a list of what my kids owe me. It's blank. Here's a list of what my boss owes me. Guess what? It's blank. When you live a life of freedom, nobody owes you anything. Not yourself, not others, not the world, not your higher power or your God. You're just free. You're free and when you are free, then you will do things without expectations. Um, when we raise our children and we finally send them out and we did it just to do it, just to do the right thing, then I don't need a thank you. Thanks, Dad, for putting me through college or whatever. Thanks for your GI Bill. If I do it for the right reasons, then, then I'm free. Um, I have the, I used to be better at this. I'm failing it now. But um, I would say I'm making coffee for, for God. In the morning, I would make coffee, right? And it was really for Jeanette, because I, I don't drink coffee. Imagine if I drank coffee. This is me without caffeine. I'd be like off the wall. So if I make the coffee for God, then if Jeanette says, I don't like this, then I'm not hurt anymore, because then I make it for her in the, in the first place. Does that make sense? So I made the coffee for God, then I don't need a thank you. I don't need a pat on the back. I don't need any kind of affirmation that didn't do it for you. If, um, you know, if, if Greg and I were, if I said, hey, Greg, you want to meet for lunch? Okay, cool. Let's meet at 12. And I show up at 12, right? And Greg doesn't show up for 12, till 12.10, 12.15. But in my mind, I say, well, why did I show up in the first place? Did I do it to please him? Or is it because it's the right thing to do? And, I, and, I, and for me personally, if I did it for God, then I don't, then I'm good. Then I'm good. Then, I, then he doesn't owe me anything. It's a lifestyle of nobody owes me anything. But I just owe it to everybody else to, to show up and to be honest. And in forgiveness, it's interesting, right? Because then people say, well, Ryan, did you just become a doormat? No, because sometimes after forgiveness, you have to redefine the relationship. Okay? And when you redefine the relationship, that might mean... I'll give you a real example. Um, another example for uh, Plumber Dan. So Plumber Dan, 
um, he owned a plumbing company, ADC Plumbing, and he hired mostly guys that are in recovery. And I lived in the house as a seminary student with a bunch of drug addicts who were staying sober, mandatory Bible studies on Mondays, and it was just, it was just a crazy, crazy house. But that's who Dan wanted to have in the house. It's a bunch of drug addicts, and then they adopted a little girl who there was nine years old, and then the sons, and it was, it was wild, right? Um, one of the guys, Dan said, hey, this is, you, don't, you don't get a choice in this. Everybody's, you're coming to church with me? This is how all recovery houses work. You will do this, this, and this. They give them some left and right lateral limits, and it's a tight leech until they can establish sobriety. Do they, do they give them um, freedom? So one guy says, you ain't, you ain't the boss of me. And he's like, you're right. You're right, because you no longer work for me as of now. So Dan redefined the relationship. He forgave him for that kind of disrespect and that, that betrayal and that he used him. But he redefined the relationship and said, you no longer work for me. That's why I can't tell you what to do. So pack your bags and the door's that way. And um, I know a buddy of mine had to do that with his kids. He goes, in our house, there is no drugs. And if you do drugs, you will pack your bags and you'll be out. And I'm like, what'd you do? He's like, he did drugs. So I had him pack his bags and we kicked him out. And his son ended up in jail and it was the hardest thing for them to watch. It was the hardest thing for them to watch, but, but he loved them enough where, where he, he, held them, he held them to it. Okay, uh, let's, go, let's go back to, to uh, forgiveness, canceling debts, and then at the end, this is just icing on the cake, is you wish them a blessing or you pray for them that they'll be blessed. The first time I ever saw this, it was on a, it was on this chaplain's, it was a sticky note. I, when I get to a base, I just kind of just walk around and I, and I found this chapel and I, and I went into this chaplain's office. He wasn't there, but I looked on his, I looked about, uh, behind his desk and he had a little white sticky note there and the sticky note said, bless him, change me. And I, my mind took a picture of that and it just, I never forgot that. So I've added this to my version of how to forgive at the very end. Bless him, change me. Bless her, change me. And we'll have to do this often. When you're driving on the road and you're going only 100 miles an hour and a German just cuts you off and gets back in the other lane for whatever reason why they keep doing that to me, it's, it's an ongoing thing. I choose to forgive that person. That was very dangerous what they just did, but I choose to forgive them. And if you can forgive everybody for everything that's ever going on and, and happening, it, it just, it's just an ongoing thing. At the same time, having the wisdom to know when to redefine the relationship and say, okay, okay this, this is the line. You've crossed it, now I'm redefining our relationship. Okay? Even with your children, if it's hard as it may be, you might have to kick them out one day. You might have to kick them out one day because you're redefining the, the relationship. Okay? But it looks different for everybody. So just uh, take a couple minutes here and... and and write down what, what comes down, then I have something for us after that. When enough time has passed, I'll, I, I have a list of other people who might need to be forgiven.
as you're writing, I, I, have, I have this, this illustration on, on bitterness. Um, there's this, there's this, my mom used to use this when she was cooking. It's this Filipino sauce called patis. You know what patis is? Right? It stinks. It is like the, but they say it, it, it smells like hell, but it tastes like heaven, right? Especially on the right, if you put it on the right thing. Anyways, patis, right? It's just, it's this nasty thing. Imagine this cup was, was full of, uh, of patis, which if it was, it would stink up this whole room, right? It's like that durian fruit in the Middle East. Like, do, do not bring in, there, there are signs in the Middle East. Do not bring in durian into this building. Anyways, if this was full to the brim of, of bitter, stinky water, and I did not learn how to do this, then I'm walking around with a cup full of bitterness. And let's just say I'm walking and minding my own business, right? And then, and then Dan here just bumps into me, and I spill this nasty substance all over the place. Well, what's, re what's the real issue there? That he kind of bumped me? Or that there was something already in my cup that was nasty and affects everybody, and it changes the environment? Right? This is the issue. When we don't learn to forgive, we walk around with this cup, and a kid can say, hey, Daddy, look what I drawed. And I'm like, I just mopped in this place. And I spew out this anger on them. And it wasn't about the fact that they stepped on this clean floor that I just mopped. It was about, it was about the fact that I, there's some stuff in my soul that I haven't addressed. I haven't dealt, I haven't dealt with it. And, and I, I, this is one of my fears. Let me, let me tell you one of my fears is that, is that, that my snappiness and my reactions to my children will affect them in, in the long run. And I think we've all had that, right? I, many people have confessed that. Like, when is the last time before I snap for this kid really, like, before it affects them for the rest of their life? And so we, we, we do it again. Like, oh, my gosh, that's guilt. I made a mistake again. I chose to make a mistake, and it, it's ongoing. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and say, okay, that you, you have your list. But here are some people that you might have uh, forgotten. Okay. Is your mom or dad on that list? Yeah? Okay, that's good. Because they should be. Is your brother or sister on that list? As they should be. Are your children on that list? Are your grandparents on that list? Aunts and uncles, cousins, neighbors, your boss, subordinates, teacher, or teacher's aide, a coach, a mentor, a landlord, a tenant. When you make an exhaustive list, which usually takes a long time, right? Well, it takes a long time. And then you sit down with, with, with people who know you. It could be a friend, it could be a spouse, Girlfriend, boyfriend, fiance, whatever. You can say, am I, am, I, am I missing anything? Our A drivers in life can help us. Like, hey, what about this person? Like, oh, I forgot about that. Like, my brother helped me by saying, do you remember? Remember what happened to us as kids? See, I would have I held on to that cup of bitterness because I didn't even know it was there. And I believe I didn't find out until I was ready. And for some reason, it took 33 years to get there. And then, for the next few years, I had to wrestle with, okay, how do I read my parents into this thing? Because no parent wants to hear, no parent wants to hear, hey, Dad, when I was this old, I was, I was abused. When I was this old, I lost this. When I, was, when I was a junior in high school, I woke up and somebody was doing something to me. It's a true story, right? Like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you step into that? And as parents, do you want to know what has happened to your kids? Are you, yeah, right? We want to help them heal, but we can't be surprised because a lot of things have happened to those children in the other room. They're just not ready to say it. They're not ready to, they're not ready to read you into their story. And maybe it's the way we're acting. Maybe, maybe a goal in our life, and tomorrow we're going we're gonna to create a mission statement for our homes as well as a personal one. But maybe, maybe a goal would be to be true, resilient houses that we commit as a community, to make our houses the safest place to be. 
because school's already brutal. School is way brutal. Kids are mean. I mean, you're talking to someone who's been the shortest person in every class he's been in. Kids can say some mean things. So they already have it hard on the outside. Why don't we, make, why don't we commit to making the home the safest environment ever? A place where they can go and say, here's what I'm struggling with, and then it's okay. We, they, they, that's what they should know. That's what they should know is that, that there's no place safer than to go in my house and to tell my mom and dad what I'm going through, what happened. Ryder has told me some things that has happened at Patch Middle School that blew my mind. Even as someone who listens to brokenness for a living, I was like, no, there's no way. And as he's telling me these things, he's got tears in his eyes because he can't believe that people would do these things to each other. There's, there's, there's no place where you can't find some, some, some brokenness. So we'll commit, we'll commit to that, um, creating houses uh, as a safe environment. Okay. I think that's about... I think that's about it for today. It's, it's, it's really heavy, right? It's really heavy. If you need, I'll go through this list with you. If you already have someone to talk to, uh, you know, your professional help or, or counselor or whatever, this, bring, bring this list. This is always a good thing. It's always a good thing to do. Um, My wife has some notes for me too, like talking about who do I confess to? How do I name my emotions? And we talked about a, a little bit of those things, but, but who? Um, I always see in my life who's, who's coming around the most. And then I know who my, my friends are. When I, when I start to build community, like right when we first get to a duty station, it's like I'm thinking first and foremost, um, who are we going to do life with? And then it takes, it takes one year of transition and then the second year is, is like, it's solid because we have our little community. We have our group where we're, we're people that we trust and people we know, and it, it's tight. I'm not saying everybody gets to know everything because sometimes that's not unwise. But when you're surrounded with, with a tight-knit group of people, um, then you're known, you walk known, you walk healed, and it's infectious. And then the third year, because usually these, there are three-year orders, like this one's 36 months, it's this transition of, of weaning us off of like, okay, um, I'm preparing myself for, for our departure. I'm preparing the children for their departure. Um, Jeanette sometimes will say, in her mind, I can see it like, okay, I'm not, I'm starting to detach. Me, I'll make best friends all, but up, all the way up until the airport. Like, I just want to connect with everybody all the, all the way until the end. But, um, but yeah. Okay. How do we close this? Um, probably going to have to forgive as you go out in town and uh, experience Garmish. Vacation's super hard. It's easy to yell at kids, but try it. Try it. See, see, see how easy it is. See how it comes up. And then um, if you want to share stories tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning we'll, we'll meet. If you look at the schedule, uh, it'll happen quick because Idlevice, especially in the winter, does not mess around. When they say get out of the room at 11, they mean it. And they will start charging late fees, and they, they're not messing around. So because we have to be out, at, um, out of the rooms at 11, child care pickup goes all the way to 1215. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do child care drop-off. We'll do that um, the final uh, couple sessions. And they will be, I'm going to verify with Grady. It's the, the final one is definitely a plenary session where I'll have everybody in here together. We'll write our mission statements. And then um, the session before that will be breaking family patterns. And then we will we'll make a call tomorrow because weather gets a vote. We, I want to take a group photo either outside by the Idlevice sign. There's a little photo thing. Or we can do that in here. We'll just, we'll just play it by ear. But we've got to do the photo, and then I'd like to give us a final charge, and then we check out, and then, and then that's it. Does that sound good? I, I hope, I hope and pray that um, this this time from 12 o'clock on is very meaningful for you, that you see your children in a way that you've never seen them before, that it makes you more gracious, it makes you more tender-hearted towards one another, and and together that that we just all I just I want all of our commands because we're from mostly Africa, but we gave seats to, to Sawcap and to, to Mar Forath. 
for you to come back to your command and be like, man, this place is different. This person is different. And they will, exp they will see that if you're doing these things. It's a win to just, if you, if you move from here to here, that's a win. And it's also some, some people um, this weekend might, might dive fully in, head first, boom, deep end. Terry Crews style. Okay, that's all I have. If there's no further questions, uh, enjoy your lunch and time together. Enjoy Garmish. Thank you.